Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to our worship this Christmas Eve. The theme of our service this year is What Child Is This? In our lessons, in our message later on, in the music of this night, and in our praises, we explore the answer to that question. Just who is this who has come to us at Christmas Eve? What has he come to do for us? As we begin our worship tonight, let's begin with prayer. Almighty God, you made this holy night shine with the brightness of the true light. Grant that as we have known the wonder of that light on earth, we may also behold him in all his glory in the life to come. Through your only Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson this Christmas Eve is from the book of the prophet Micah. Micah's prophecy not only unfolds for us the location of Jesus' birth in Bethlehem, but also reveals him to be a king. We read from Micah chapter 5, beginning at verse 2. Bethlehem Ephrathah, you are small among the clans of Judah. One will come from you to be ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from antiquity, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of the ruler's brothers will return to the people of Israel. He will stand and shepherd them in the strength of the Lord, in the majestic name of the Lord his God. They will live securely, for then his greatness will extend to the ends of the earth. He will be their peace. Here ends our first lesson. Uh, we continue with the Christmas carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem. The gospel lesson this evening, the lesson for Christmas Eve, is from the book of Luke, chapter 2. We read the first 14 verses. We have the account of Jesus' birth and the announcement of the angels to the shepherds. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. 
And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Here ends the gospel lesson. We continue with our next hymn, Angels We Have Heard on High.
How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God? And that is what we are. Amen. Word of God for our consideration this Christmas Eve is from the book of Matthew, chapter 1. When we think of the Christmas account, we usually hear Luke's gospel, as we heard read a few moments ago, and the account of Mary and Joseph traveling to Bethlehem. And there's something more of Mary's perspective there, perhaps. But in Matthew's gospel, we have the account of Jesus' birth from Joseph, his father's perspective. Again, Matthew chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, who was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man, and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins." Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but he did not have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. This is God's word. Brothers and sisters in Christ, have you had your fill of Christmas specials yet and made for Christmas movies? When I was a little boy, I had two favorites among the Christmas specials, and I always hoped that they wouldn't air on Wednesday nights because our family went to Advent services on church those evenings. The two specials were Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and A Charlie Brown Christmas. Some years ago, it seemed that the, the Christmas specials focused on discovering the, the true meaning of Christmas, and, and usually they concluded that it had something to do with uh, charity or kindness towards your fellow man. More recently, it seems that many of the Christian movies, uh, Christmas rather, movies and specials uh, are focused uh, upon saving Christmas in some way, by which they usually mean that they are going to save it from some villain or a natural catastrophe who would keep the presents and gifts from being delivered. The original Christmas family was also involved in discovering the true meaning of Christmas. That They learned that we don't save Christmas, however. Christmas saves us. We usually, as I said, focus on Jesus and his mother Mary. Joseph is there too, but we hear about him less. He seems to be something of a background character. Tonight, however, we have his experience before us. It is Joseph that is the prominent player in this section of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1. And his experience helps us to understand the true meaning of this event. That, that meaning has to be the, the meaning of the child himself. And, and so these words unfold for us the answer to the question, what child is this? Tonight we see the answer to that question is the answer of reason, the answer of heaven, the answer of prophets, and the answer of faith. Joseph's first answer to the question is the obvious one, I suppose, the logical one. His initial response to Mary's pregnancy gives us the answer of reason. The birth of Jesus came about this way. After his mother had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man, 
and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. Joseph's initial response to Mary's pregnancy is the same one that you or I would have. Mary had been unfaithful to him. That was the only conclusion he could reach. She had slept with another man. She was carrying someone else's child, some man that Joseph either had never met or certainly didn't know about. That is the only reasonable conclusion. And Joseph is far from the only person who's ever come to that conclusion. Thousands of years ago, uh, Jewish rabbis accused Mary of adultery and Jesus of being an illegitimate child as a result. We can only imagine that the townspeople in Nazareth must have uh, imagined that uh, the, the couple had e either gotten themselves into some kind of trouble, they had displayed a, a terrible lack of self-control before the wedding, or again, somehow Mary had been unfaithful to the man to which she was engaged. And I know some modern theologians who still today would speculate that Mary perhaps mixed, uh, hooked up with some Roman soldier that we don't know the name of from history. None of those may be very kind assumptions, but they are at least consistent with logic and reason. Although Joseph's initial answer to what child is this was not the correct one, we should pause to note the godly intent of his reaction. He did not want to be taken for a fool, so he decided to end his relationship with Mary. In those days, an engagement had to be uh, broken off through the process of divorce. But Matthew here tells us that Joseph was a righteous man. And so uh, he may have been hurt, but he was not the kind of person to be vindictive. The law of Moses allowed him to require to ask that Mary be stoned to death. Joseph, however, chose a path of love instead. He would keep this as uh, secret and as quiet as was possible. He would, he would try to shield Mary from uh, as much of a public disgrace as he could manage. He would keep the proceeding secret. Perhaps Mary could move somewhere else where she could try to salvage some shreds of her reputation. The answer of reason to... What child is this provides a warning to us when it comes to Jesus and his promises. We like to think that we are smart, sophisticated people. No one pulls a wool over our eyes. But, but if we think that we are going to judge God according to the standards of our corrupted human reason, and it is corrupt, then we are going to deny ourselves his greatest gifts. We will live our sad and colorless lives without miracle or wonder. We won't be able to hear him properly when he reveals the mystery of his grace and the depths of his saving love. Cold mathematical equations don't rescue souls from hell or shine a path on the light to heaven. The child is so much more and so much different than reason's answer to the question. Mercifully, the Lord did not abandon Joseph to his misguided conclusions. He revealed to him instead the answer of heaven. But after Joseph had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. People are interested in Jesus for many reasons. Businessmen have studied his leadership style and written books about it, but Jesus did not come to advance our careers or help us to get along better in our management skills. One prominent 
lecturer today claims that Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is the centerpiece of his earthly ministry. And it's certainly an example of fine teaching on his part. It's a call to a life that more more genuinely is driven by love, one that gives a, a, a radical attention and conformity to the truths of God's word and his will. But it is nothing new that Jesus was revealing there. It dusts off a very old theology that God's people should have been following all along. Modern church leaders are sometimes eager to make Jesus conform to the values and sensibilities of our contemporary culture. They'll try to squeeze him into the, the mold of a, a champion of the sexual revolution or an early adopter of socialistic principles. I hope it won't disappoint you if I tell you that all of this is nothing but myth-making. Neither Mary nor Joseph nor Jesus' later disciples would be able to recognize the picture of Jesus that they are trying to paint. No, when, when, when heaven itself spoke on the issue, there were two main truths that the angel revealed. What has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Jesus had no human father. God created the child that was growing inside of Mary. He used the genetic material from his mother Mary and God's own divine power. And so Jesus was God in a body, the maker and ruler of the universe united to human flesh and blood. He became one of us, yet remained the same God he has always been. That makes our Christmas celebration unique uh, among the holidays. This is not merely the birthday of Jesus that we are celebrating or the, the birthday of a great man who made a, a big difference in our lives. This is not like a President's Day or, or Veterans Day when we remember someone whose life has uh, been a great blessing, whose, whose time on earth has made a, a big difference in what we have and what we experience. No, we have come to worship Jesus. Oh, come, let us adore him, we sing in the hymn, because wonder of wonders, the Lord himself has entered our world and joined our family, and he's graced the whole human race with his physical presence here. The angel reveals also this, that it all happens with a clear purpose. You are to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Well, the name says it all. Jesus' name means the Lord saves. And, and, and the disaster from which he saves us is not a worldwide pandemic or climate change or racial injustice, although those may all be worthy causes in their own right. He saves us from our sins. Because of him, it doesn't condemn us anymore. It cannot kill us anymore. We're free. When heaven answers the question, what child is this, it it answers, here is your God and Savior. The angel spoke these truths to Joseph on behalf of heaven, but he was not the first to give those answers. Hundreds of years before this, the same truth had been the answer of the prophets. Now, all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will be, with, be, be pregnant rather, and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. In Jesus, God is with us. That was what Isaiah had revealed 700 years earlier. 700 years, go back 700 years uh, in, in, in our time, and you are going back to a time when there is no United States, uh, a time before pilgrims and Puritans came, uh, a time before Columbus or even the Reformation or the Renaissance. The world 700 years ago is still languishing at the end of the Dark Ages. 700 years before the angel appeared to Joseph, the prophet Isaiah knew the identity of the child his wife would bear. Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. 
What a comforting thought. So often we feel like we are alone, trying to find our way through a hostile and confusing world that makes little sense. We, we carry our guilt by ourselves. We keep our fears bottled up inside. We may be surrounded by people, but we still feel alone with no one to help. No, Jesus has come, and he is God with us. The prophet does not call him God is vaguely aware of us. He doesn't offer the name, God's mildly interested in our affairs. No, God is with us. Jesus has joined us in our struggles and involved himself in our concerns. The Lord has jumped in on our side and taken over the entire project of human redemption. And to this very day, he still lives in our hearts by faith. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, Paul wrote the Galatians. The promise and power of God's presence in our world, our lives, and our hearts is an important part of the answer to the question, what child is this? Speaking of faith, Joseph's response to the heavenly dream provides a clear example of the answer of faith. When Joseph woke up, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but he did not have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. The implications and the, the consequences of believing the angel's message were, were not easy for Joseph to bear. Taking Mary as his wife and and raising Jesus as his own son, well, that was going to appear to all the world as a confession of guilt on Joseph's part. From, from, from where we stand, jo Joseph perhaps appears as one of the most godly men on all the pages of Scripture. The Lord tells him to do something, and Joseph simply does what God asks, even though it may be odd or uncomfortable for him to do so, but like Mary, his reputation with his peers was ruined by doing what God told him here to do. That obedience makes it all the more clear that his faith was sincere. This child was the divine Savior God's word reveals him to be. And friends, such faith is not the smallest miracle of Jesus' birth. What Martin Luther once observed about Mary's faith is true of Joseph as well. The virgin birth, he wrote, is a mere trifle for God. That God should become a man is a greater miracle. But the most amazing of all is that this maiden, and we can add this man, should believe. That miracle continues in our own faith today. Tonight, our faith still answers the question, what child is this? He is God in the flesh. He is the Savior of the world and of us. And perhaps the greatest miracle of all, he has come here for a sinner like me. May that be your answer and your faith tonight and always. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We follow with the next hymn.
As we conclude this evening, please join me in prayer. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for fulfilling your ancient promises and sending us a Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. He left the glory of heaven and became one of us, clothing himself in human flesh. He became our brother so that through him we might become your children. Open our eyes to see the marvel of his grace, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that we, through his poverty, might become rich. Open our hearts to grasp the peace Jesus has given us with you and the access he provides to your throne in every need. Dear Savior, give us a simple, childlike faith that sees your glory even in your lowliness, Fill us with joy and wonder as we join the song of the angels. Share the excitement of the shepherds and worship you with the magi. Let the truth, love, and redemption you have brought live in our hearts and change our lives. Teach us to keep all these things and ponder them in our hearts like Mary did. And since you came for all people, move us to share the good news of great joy we have in you. Tonight, you've shown us your glory again. One day, bring us into your glory in heaven, where we will join saints and angels in praising you for the mercy you have shown to us poor sinners. Hear us, Lord, for the sake of your name. Amen. And we pray as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the blessing of the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Our closing hymn is Silent Night. <laughs>